Most welcome to this afternoon's seminar to be given by Frederick Charpentier Jungquist on the topic of climate variability and food insecurity in medieval and early modern Europe. Frederick Charpentier Jungquist is Associate Professor of History at Stockholm University. He started his academic career as a medieval historian and was awarded his PhD in history at Stockholm University in 2014. Charpentier Jungquist was a visiting scholar at the Department of Geography at the University of Cambridge between the years 2017 and 2019, and he has close relationships, research collaborations across Europe and in China. He's also affiliated to the Bolin Center for Climate Research at Stockholm University. Frederick Charpentier Jungquist is both an historian and paleoclimatologist, a climate historian. In his research in medieval history, he conducted a comprehensive comparative study of the royal power in the preserved medieval Scandinavian laws for his doctoral dissertation. Frederick, in fact, began paleoclimate research in collaboration with physical geographers while working on his doctoral thesis in medieval history. In later years, he has increasingly conducted research within paleoclimatology using mainly natural so-called proxy archives like tree ring data and so on to reconstruct and understand temperature and hydroclimate variability during the past two millennia as well as to study climatic impacts on human history. With his extraordinary potential for combining history and paleoclimatology, his current research interests encompass a broad scope, ranging from the link between class, past climate variability and historical harvest yields to the effect of plague outbreaks on the history of European building activity. Frederick Charpentier Lindqvist's publication record is impressive, both in its scope and in its depth. Among his more recent key publications are the articles Northern Hemisphere Hydroclimate Variability Over the Past 12 Centuries, published in Nature in 2016, and the article Linking European Building Activity with Plague History in the Journal of Archaeological Science in 2018, the article Centennial Scale Temperature Change in Last Millennium, Millennium Simulations and Proxy-Based Reconstructions in the Journal of Climate, published in 2019, and the monograph Lag Fest Kungamakt under hög medeltiden <laughs> in English, Legally Regulated Royal Power During the High Middle Ages, published in 2016. Personally, I would also like to mention specifically the article The Spatio-Temporal Distribution of Late Viking Age Swedish Runestones, a reflection of the Christianization process and its speed, which was published in the Journal of Archaeological Science in 2018, and which demonstrates, I think, the proficiency and combinatory creativity of his research. Frederick is also actively engaged in popular science and public outreach activities. He is the author of three popular science books, for the first two of which he was awarded the Clio Prize in 2016, and this is an annual prize rewarding a distinguished early career Swedish historian. And he frequently gives popular science lectures and makes contributions to media. Now, as a Profetura Scientia Fellow, he leads the interdisciplinary project, Disentangling Sociopolitical and Climatic Factors for Food Insecurity in Early Modern Europe. So, Frederick, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for the very nice presentation. So today I'm going to present this talk, 
climate variability and food insecurity in medieval and early modern Europe. I'm mainly going to provi uh, provide a background to the research field of climate change human history links with focus on medieval and early modern Europe as a kind of introduction. Then I will go on to present the preliminary results of a comprehensive literature review in this field that is going to be submitted by the end of April. And finally, I will wrap up with presenting empirical research or empirical results of a study of climate variability and grain prices in early modern Europe. And this is, as Christina said, studies within the framework of a larger project or almost research program with, uh, with about 12 collaborators. Some are all only involved in a couple of studies, some are involved in the whole project for five, six years. And for the presentation today, or rather for the two articles this presentation is based on, two articles in progress, I want to mention five collaborators. First and foremost, I want to acknowledge my main uh, collaborator and project partner in my full project, Dr. Andrea Saim at the University of Freiburg. Also contributing, Bo Christiansson at the Danish Meteorological Institute in Copenhagen. Jan Esper at the University of Mainz in Germany. Claude Lahart at the same university. And finally, Peter Tell at the Danish Meteorological Institute in Copenhagen. So this field of studying past climate changes in relation to various factors in human history. It's a field that I have exploded in the last 10, 15, or maybe 20 years. However, it's much older than most people think. It's going more than 100 years back in time, and I'm going to present some of the key contributors from various disciplines to this field as an introduction. And let's start with Edvard Bruckner. He was the first one that really studied this in a scientific way in the 1890s, a German geographer, an outstanding climatologist. He published an article in German in 1895 where he linked grain prices and grain yields across Western, Central and Eastern Europe to precipitation variability in long instrumental precipitation records covering the 18th and 19th centuries. And he found, to simplify it, that grain yields were poorer and thus grain prices higher in Western and Central Europe during wet decades than during dry decades. Whereas in Russia, with the continental climate, it was good with, dry, with, dry condi uh, with wet conditions for grain yields and those low prices. And he also managed to link the, qu uh, the quantities of grain trade from Russia in the 18th and 19th century in relation to precipitation changes in Europe and could see that larger quantities were exported from Russia during wet decades than dry decades. And he also discussed in a very informal way, if, uh, informative way how these trade patterns in grain also influenced trade policies when it was a lack of grain and high grain prices in Western Europe. You had a more liberal trade policy in general to, uh, to import grain and more custom fees and so forth when you have good production at home. And he also wrote a couple of other articles. But his work is not widely read today or not even cited and quite unknown because in this field, basically only publications in English is counted, even in German itself. It's only English uh, yeah, publications in English basically that are cited in this research field. So the one that got the honor to uh, open up this research field was a British economist, Sir Breckenridge, William Breckenridge, and he published an article in 1921, another in 1922, basically showing the same thing, but not in, 
but not discussing trade patterns or trade policies. He just showed that in Western and Central Europe, it's beneficial for keeping grain prices low, that it's dry in summer and spring. And he used a very impressively large data set and actually outstanding advanced statistics that are even difficult to calculate today with special statistical softwares. And how we managed to do it before personal computers by hand is not, it's something I can't understand, but he managed to do that and introduced uh, a statistical framework for studying the relationship between prices and climate. However, both Bruckner and Breveridge had quite, so to say, dry academic style in writing and published in specialized journals. The one in this field of linking climate changes in the past to human history that got a, so to say, wider audience and also wrote popular science books was the American geographer Ellisworth Huntington at the turn of the 20th century, or rather the first decades of the 20th century. Huntington was the first one to use natural proxy archives from natural sciences to combine with archaeological and documentary record. We need to remember that at the early 20th century, hardly had any paleoclimate records. And for example, pollen records was not properly dated because this was four decades before the discovery of the C14 dating method. But he had one record that was newly discovered, the science of dendrochronology, or de rather dendroclimatology. An American astronomer, Andrew Douglas, have developed millennia-long tree ring records from living and dead trees in the American Southwest, in particular in Arizona and California, and that then is absolutely dated and annually resolved. And he found that wide tree rings in the American Southwest represent wetter conditions, better growing conditions in this dry environment, where narrow rings represent dry years. And Huntington used this data and extrapolated in lack of other data for conditions in Asia. Of course, Asia and North American hydroclimate has nothing to do with each other, this even opposite trend. So the results are biased, but conceptually this is a new thing. And he tried to link multicentennial periods of severe drought on the Asian steppes to large-scale human migration of nomad groups out of the steppes, both towards China and towards Eastern Europe, and linking these migration patterns to drought. And uh, today this science is very outdated, but conceptually it's about 100 years before its time. He wrote a book in 1907, The Pulse of Asia, that is still worth to be read as a conceptual framework in this field. After that, not very many scholars engaged in these fields in this field for more than six decades. And the main reason for this was the lack of actually climate data at this time, how climate had varied prior to instrumental measurements that started around 1700 in Europe and even later elsewhere on Earth. You still didn't have any paleoclimate data. It's a very recent thing. So it was very speculative. And therefore, archaeologists and historians in general took no notice of this research. It was simply too speculative because you didn't have the hard data of how climate had changed. It was one historian, actually, economic historian, that is worth to mention, Gustav Utterström, a Swedish historian. He wrote in 1955 a still very well cited article written in English that is a conceptual framework for studying climate impacts on Scandinavian or Northern European agriculture and economy in early modern and medieval times. And he argued that cold decades and especially cold years most likely corresponded to all large scale harvest failures here in the north and especially cold springs and cold summers was a problem and that colder than average centuries also 
meant more hardship for the agrarian population here in the far north than warm decades and that this will be seen in the demographic record and can explain the crisis, so to say, in the 17th century, for example. But he only wrote this single very well cited article because Utterström also had no data to work with. This was five decades before the first millennia long temperature reconstructions from tree ring data for Scandinavia became available. He had some spotty fragmentary historical sources, written sources to work with, but it was too little to do any quantitative analysis. So it had to wait for six decades until anyone picked this up. But actually, it was one French historian that did pick up this concept, Emmanuel Leroy Ladurie. He wrote a book in 1967, where he developed methods to transform qualitative information in written documentary sources, for example, for wine harvest states, into quasi-quantitative um, climate indices. And he also discussed in a very informed way possible influences on uh, demographic development, economic well-being and societal conditions among the French peasantry in the last millennium from climate uh, variability and also for Europe more generally. He draw the conclusion that climate had had a very big impact on the well-being of the peasantry and to society in general in, er, in pre-modern time on interannual to decayal timescales, but that climate had not had any notable effect on multi-decayal and centennial timescales because he argued or thought that climate had been rather stable for over a thousand years on longer timescales. It was only the high frequency interannual to decayal variability. And that was the state of the art knowledge at that time. So he said there's no long-term trends but clear interannual to decayal shocks or impacts of climate variability. And uh, now the picture disappeared again. You can maybe live without seeing these gentlemen. Uh, but now they are back. And we have another fellow, Herbert Lamb, an outstanding British meteorologist that in the 70s wrote the standard books in climatology that are still, still very worth to read. They're still among the best written. And he was also an amateur historian, working even in archives himself to dig out documentary data of especially climate and climate impacts in the past millennium, especially in England and Scotland. And in the 70s, he found with the first ice core records from Greenland and Antarctica, more tree ring records, more well dated pollen records, and also the new documentary data that you had had low frequency climate variability in the last millennia. You had have dec uh, centuries or multi centennial periods that have been significantly warmer or colder and large scale weather pattern and precipitation changes in Europe and elsewhere. And he was the first one to argue that these long term changes in climate, the first one since Huntington at least, that centennial scale changes also had societal impact, especially in marginal areas. And this was picked up at that time by a British geographer a PhD student in geography, Martin Perry, that wrote his doctoral dissertation in the 1970s about farming in late medieval times and early modern times in northern England and southern Scotland. And he built a model, a statistical model of the risk of harvest failures at different elevations above sea level in different climate regimes. And he found that with by the maximum approximate cooling that you could estimate in the 17th century, in the climax of Little Ice Age, that the risk uh, for harvest failures at upper elevation cultivation in southern Scotland increased by 500% compared to warmer centuries, and was one of the reasons where cereal cultivation was abundant, abundant in uh, deserted uh, cereal cultivation at that time. And 
Lay at the same time in Switzerland, a Swiss historian, also trained as geographer, Christian Pfister, at the University of Bern, now an emeritus professor and still a very active researcher in his upper 70s. I had the pleasure to meet him and chat with him on a conference in um, August. And he developed not only a model for um, the risk of harvest failure, but actually for estimating harvest size and quantitative estimates of dye reproduction at different, different areas with different technology in different climate regimes, focusing on the Alps. And he also continued earlier efforts how to transform information about weather and climate in documentary sources into quantitative estimates of past climate. And the so-called Pfister indices that he developed in the 70s and 80s are the standard way to do this all around the world, and including China and Japan uh, in this field. And he is, uh, I would say, the leading climate historian in Europe still. We also have another person that is important to point out, Bruce Campbell, a British historian. And quite late in his career, after a long career as a medieval historian with focus on economic history in the, his late 50s, he started to get interested in climate or paleoclimatology. And he introduced tree ring records and to a certain extent also ice core records as a historical source, how you can use this to understand uh, agricultural history and to a wider extent economic history. And he argued that during periods of abrupt and significant climate changes in pre-modern agricultural societies, you have to give climate change a role of agency together with a agents related to human action alone. So the political, socio-economic factors need to be considered together with external environmental factors, also epidemics like the plague, as a, not as a backdrop to historical change, but as an agent to change. And he was the first historian that really managed to conceptually introduce and combine external environmental forcings together with forces related to human agency. And uh, after that, he written a number of articles and one monograph where he can integrate climate in a multi-causal way in a larger historical narrative. But now we look at a lot of gentlemen. It's only gentlemen, mostly white-haired. Well, that's the way academia traditionally looked like, although it's about to change. Now I could, if I not have been more modest than I am, I could have put up picture of myself also. <laughs> so we have 10 gentlemen. I'm not white hair yet, but I'm starting to lose my hair though. But I actually put up a Finnish colleague instead, Heli Hoftoma, a Finnish historian and geographer that took up the challenge of Gustav Utterström in her doctoral dissertation in history and used tree ring data, temperature sensitive tree ring data from Finland, uh, to combine and compare with documentary sources of harvest yields, taxes, demographic development, and general societal well-being. And she could uh, prove, with both with quantitative and qualitative methods, that indeed the cold years and clusters of cold years have been what was responsible for the main famines in Finland in late medieval and early modern time. And, it's, and that it had in particular been the late springs when the growing season started up to a month or more later that had been the major problem because then the growing season was too short and you had a high risk for autumn frost killing up off the crops because of the delayed start of the growing season. And she also points to that the big famines in Finnish history in the early 1600s and in the 1690s, where up to a third of the population died of starvation-related diseases, 
was caused by three or four very cold springs after each other, giving two short growing seasons. But she also points out that the impact on humans of harvest failures mainly are related to the prevailing socio-political and socio-economic circumstances as in time of peace, for example, and no wartime taxation and so forth, you were more resilient. And also that it really depended on the access to coast and other resources. And Healy and I is actually going later this week, she's coming to visit me in Stockholm, writing a review article of climate history in Scandinavia. A small piece aim for historians. So we can say that it has been quite a lot of key figures and many others engaged in this field for quite a long time now. But still, you have had a hard time in main historical narrative to include climate change and variability as an agent. Because in historical research, human action alone are typically considered agent and external factors are seen as a background. And if this background condition changes, is it an agent or not? Because climate or any other environmental factors, including diseases, they don't have an, a will. Are they an agent? It has been conceptually difficult to include and therefore typically ignored because it don't fit the theoretical framework. However, this is about to change and it's the contemporary global warming forcing a change because climate agency is in the forefront with contemporary global warming because you're basically forced either to acknowledge that climate change will have an impact on human society in the future or if you or you can ignore it, but that's not mainstream, so to say, today. But the implication of accepting that contemporary global warming will have different impacts on, on society, it is that climate change in the past must also have had some impacts on society. On the same time, it's a high risk of anachronistic interpretations when you interpret past climate changes in the framework of contemporary discourses about global warming and its risks with global warming, especially when you trying to look how and to what extent past climate changes influence food security is often very closely related to political agendas or policy making in the present day, which can give rise to anachronistic interpretations and also make the historical research quite political. At the same time, it's quite common still that you try to e accept that contemporary or future climate change will have impacts, but not any past climate changes. And this can be accepted simply because a common misconception that the Earth's climate had been more or less stable for thousands of years and thus rendering climate change irrelevant for human history. Uh, I will not dwell on this subject, but it also serves, serves sometimes certain political agendas and so in present day policy making. But it's mostly a matter of ignorance uh, because it's first in the last decade or two that the science of paleoclimatology has been able to find much larger changes of past climate than previously known, especially at regional scales and especially in changes in precipitation and drought on these regional scales. But the lack of awareness of this new paleoclimate data results in that it's not typically in used in present day research. It's simply a lack of knowledge of what is available. And this is not surprising that even among scholars working with climate change human history don't know what is available. Because the matter of fact is that most, at least many scientists working with present day climate change and future climate change are not aware of how climate has varied in the past, more than on a very basic level. And the reason for this is the division in the science of climatology between paleoclimatologists, mainly physical geographers, working with past climate, and meteorologists, 
working with present day climate and future climate. And it's very little communication often in between. So why should we expect that it will be a bigger, so to say, interaction between, say, environmental historians and paleoclimatologists? But I will give some brief examples of how climate has varied, or more generally what we have in terms of type of data. Here's an example of the average sum a reconstruction of the average summer temperature for the whole of Europe in the last 1,500 years. Here for the last 150 years, in red, we have the measured average European summer temperature, and in blue, the reconstructed from temperature-sensitive triggering data around Europe. It comes from a project that I led between 2016 and 2019. And very briefly, we can see that in the migration period, in the 6th century, it was rather cold. Then we have a long and rather warm medieval conditions. At the turn of the 13th century or so, turn into colder summers with the start of the so-called Little Ice Age. Maximum cooling in the 17th century and then first warming again, really, in the 20th century. Uh, I may draw the attention to the zero line here. It's not that the European average summer temperature ever had been zero degrees. It's much warmer than that. But in climatology and meteorology, you use the reference period 1961 to 1990 as the re reference period, the baseline period. So it's anomalous with regard to this baseline period. We also have reconstructions from um, uh, uh, tree ring data, mainly oak data, of spring and early summer precipitation. They don't show very large changes, and they are very, very regional scale, because precipitation change is very local, whereas temperature co varies very large scale. A summer that is warm here in Uppsala is typically warm in Paris and Berlin too. Whereas it might be a wet summer in Copenhagen, but a dry here. So it's a matter of different spatial scales between temperature and hydroclimate. Finally, we know that in present day global warming is strongest here in Northern Europe in winter and spring, and very small in summer or autumn. And we also know that during the Little Ice Age, the cooling was strongest in winter and spring, and quite small in, wind, in summer and autumn. But tree rings can only be used as a proxy for summer temperature, because trees are only growing in the summer season. So we need to go to other sources. And one such source is documentary records of one way, of one type or another. So I want to show one reconstruction of summer temperature, a uh, winter temperature, I mean, January to April average temperatures that have been reconstructed by the Swedish historian Lotta Leonhuvud that is actually sitting here today with us in 2010. And this is an outstanding reconstruction. But let's start with this red line, the measured January to April temperature in the Stockholm Observatory going back to 1756. We can start with that this winter, it was uh, released yesterday, is the warmest winter in south central Sweden since uh, 1756, by a margin of one degree Celsius, about five to six degrees warmer than the late 20th century average. It's therefore we have no snow and ice basically this winter. But I dare to say that it's probably the warmest winter back in 500 years, back to the early 16th century at least. Because Lotta was able to extend the Stockholm temperature record for winter thanks to custom documentation of the custom fees in Stockholm Harbor from when the ships could come in and not. And the first ships, when the ice broke up in the spring, is a very strong, this date of the ice breakup 
and the first ships coming in and you start to collect custom fees. It's a super strong proxy for wind average January to April temperature. It explains almost all the variance of this period. We have an overlap from 1756 to about 1900. The wooden ships couldn't sail when it was ice. And we could see here in the late 16th century, early 17th century, that it was very, very cold in this climax little ice age. Sometimes you had five or six months of ice into May, even the coldest years. Whereas already in the mid 17th, 18th century, it was quite mild, almost as mild as today. Uh, so you have a big variations here, and it of course had tremendous influences on society, because when you had ice six months a year in the Baltic, you couldn't trade, sail, and all major transports were made by sea, so you were locked up. Whereas already in warm decades in the 18th century, you could sail basically year round. But let's move on. We also have other type of date. I want to show again research from Lotta from her doctoral dissertation of tight, that, uh, tight data for the tax, uh, church tax in Sweden from 1540 to 1680 that you can estimate, approximate the total harvest yield in Sweden. And again, you have in the climax of Little Ice Age, in the coldest years and decades, very low tides, above half the harvest than already in warmer decades in the same period. And this, of course, had very major influences on society, because if you only have half the harvest, in a society that lives on grain, you are in trouble. You are indeed in trouble, and indeed you had famines. And they line up very well with these cold springs, or cold years with very late springs and cold summers. But I need to move on now to the second part of the talk and to this review article that I'm going to submit together with my colleague Andrea Saim in late April or so, the interlinkage between climate change and society in European history. And the aim with this review is to fill a gap, a lack of literature that summarizes the state of the art research from various disciplines on how climate change have affected human societies in Europe in early modern as well as medieval times. And what arguments have been put forward, what causal links between climate and societal change or socioeconomic change have been proposed, what is the major con controversial points, where do the research agree, which disciplinary differences can you see in this research and so forth. Such a review has been lacking. And I wanted to make a state of the art article about this. And you are the first today that are going to see some of the preliminary results from this literature review. So the aim is simply to assess the scholarship from different disciplines conducted in the last 20 years, 2000 to 2019, that in one way or another attempt to link climate change to some aspect in human history for medieval and early modern Europe. And especially we focus on possible causal links that have been proposed between changes in climate and changes in food production, in famines, demographic trends, agriculture practices, rural settlement structures, even social fabrics, commerce, armed conflicts and epidemics and so forth. And this literature assessment makes a qualitative as well as a quantitative assessment and elevation of 120 articles and 10 monographs that have been written in this time frame. And we work with summarizing the findings in terms of order of impacts of climate change. Unfortunately, I don't have the time to go into what is meant with order of impact, but we can start with the key findings from this literature review of the so-called first order impacts of climate change, that is the direct biophysical effects of climate change and variability on mainly food production. And it's very, very clear from the literature from all disciplines from environmental sciences, including geography, to archaeology, to history, 
to social sciences and agrarian sciences that have engaged in this field that climate variability has governed both the potential, the limits, and the risks associated both with agriculture and pastoral farming in medieval and early modern Europe. And the literature is also clear on that cold climate, especially the cold springs, in general have resulted in more adverse conditions than warmer conditions in almost all of Europe. And one reason is that I already mentioned that late springs shorten the growing season and increase the risk up here that the harvest is not ripen before the autumn frost, but further south it's also late spring increases the risk of fungi damages to crops and also that the slower ripening extend the growing season into late summer and autumn rains with again risk of uh, damages from the wet and increasing risk for fungi infections. But we also have another thing to consider. It is that long winters and late springs uh, cause the problem for pastoral farming because the animals need fresh grass. A longer season means that they have a shorter, in Central and Northern Europe, a shorter grazing season and need fodder and maybe even be indoor for a longer season. And it decreases the health of the animals, but also the milk production. And in marginal areas like in the Alps, actually late, very late and cold springs with a lot of snow during the climax of the Little Ice Age in the late 16th century, early 17th century, decreased the diary production in Switzerland with as much as 50%. So it had huge impacts. Uh, and here the spring season is again the critical one. And we can also see that the literature is very clear on that the most large-scale harvest failures was caused by cold and or very wet conditions, and especially consecutive years of poor harvests were caused by uh, several very cold years after each other. And the risk for such cold years increases when the climate is colder on average. So they're not random events. And drought, on the other hand, or too excessive precipitation, it occurs typically at quite local scale and therefore didn't have that much impact. There have been a few extreme drought years across Europe that cause harvest failures, and there have been a few very wet years, but they're individual years and not several after each other. And those years that had an impact on society was not an individual year, but the a cluster of poor years. Uh, so very little evidence in the literature that drought mattered much for pre-modern agriculture in Europe, even in the South. And finally, we have these long periods of ice and snow that I already mentioned. They could impact transportation and trade. But I also want to point out that long periods of snow and ice could be beneficial in some places. In Bejslag, in the mining district in central Sweden, all the ore and fuel transports basically was made by Slade in winter. And winters almost like this, with no snow, what a catastrophe, because you couldn't transport things to the mines or from the mines. So it really depends on where you are and what section of society you are looking on, how climate can affect that. But move on to the second order impacts of climate change, the human consequences of climate variability. To put it very simply, the literature of the last 20 years have been very clear on that uh, climate effects on per capita food productions have been, have been significant. Climate has affected the ability to produce food and either enhanced, improved the food production or decrease it, although you have been able to mitigate it to a certain extent, depending on the social conditions and the technology conditions in the society in question. And it has affected also the food prices, both on long and short timescales, and I will come back to that. <coughs> 
and is some evidence that cold and wet conditions favor the spread of cattle diseases. It's not clear cut how this happened. It could be that the animals had to be indoor for a longer time or they were more undernourished. But you can see certain such links. It's much weaker links, on the other hand, between climate change and epidemics and pandemics among humans. It had been proposed that the plague, especially Black Death, was caused by cold or wet conditions, or not that it was caused, but it helped the spread. This is no strong really evidence for this and no really clear causal links. What on the other hand is clear is that diseases like typhus and dys dysenteria typically occurred when you had um, undernourishment or even starvation. Because people during famines didn't die of undernourishment per se, they died of diseases. And certain diseases you were more vulnerable to if you uh, suffered starvation. And remember, in this period, most starvation, of course, political circumstances and socioeconomic circumstances was important, but at the bottom was harvest failures a number of years after each other and their climate played a big role, and indirectly, thus, for certain diseases. Then we can go on to the third order impact. What is the literature saying about so-called third order impacts of climate change and climate variability? I mentioned this with the changes in food availability. And the food availability changes affected health, life expectancy, and reproduction. It's a quite much from written about it in the last few years. And it's also very clear that famines was caused by a combination of adverse climate conditions for agriculture for several years and certain sociopolitical factors decreasing the food security. It's also clear that sometime in the early 18th century, most societies in Europe became resilient against famines caused by harvest failures. In some countries like England and the Netherlands, this resilience already occurred in the early 17th century, where different poor law systems, advances in trade, and uh, political stability and economic prosperity made you more or less you mean against uh, famines in peacetime at least. Whereas in other societies, especially landlocked areas in Central Europe, you were vulnerable until the 19th century for climate caused harvest failures that would lead to famines. But in general, I would say the 17th century is the breaking point between when famines are caused by harvest failures and when famines are caused by political factors. Finally, you can actually, from recent research, mainly in Germany and England, see, basically observe, the effects of climate on humans from arco, uh, arco, astro, uh, wait, astro, ostro, I mean, astro archaeological research of skeletons. You have been able in Bavaria, in southern Germany, for example, to see that the warmest 50-year periods in the last millennium, male height was about five centimeters longer than during the coldest 50-year periods. Five centimeters is quite much. It's a little bit less on females, but it's still very notable. And this must be linked, of course, to the availability of food in childhood. Uh, so you can actually see the link, and it's impressive clear link from the human height to the availability of food and this match up very good with the climatic record and it's clearest in central europe again the landlocked area with less trade and there have also been many proposed links between climate change and sociopolitical change and causality is typically not proven in this research I may first point out that most of this research linking sociopolitical changes to climate changes are not conducted by archaeologists or historians, but by geographers. <coughs> and they're simply based on, on temporal correlation between a climate indices and, say, a demographic or economic time series of some kind. But it's typically hard <coughs> to see 
any causality here. Although I would say that there are some plausible links because of changes in food availability and food security might depending on the sociopolitical and socioeconomic circumstances affect societal stability, especially if you get a food crisis. Then there are finally a lot of claims of links between armed conflicts, number of armed conflicts and climate change. But again, we have not been able, or I have not been able, to detect any causal links that seems plausible. It's again temporal correlations with a lot of problems in the data. And I don't believe in these links that have been proposed. They go all the way back actually to Huntington, 1907. But it's really messy data sets where you happen to have agreements here and there. So what this is leading us to the summary and the conclusion of this literature review. And we can see that, very clearly see, that despite an increase in interdisciplinary research in recent years, two research traditions, two different distinct research traditions sticks out. One mainly represented by natural scientists based on cor statistical correlations between time series but without discussing or showing at least causality between changes in climate and changes in some aspect of human society. And then we have one research tradition, mainly from historians, discussing causality a lot, but without establishing any correlations or any statistical relationships. In my opinion, it's Im important both to discuss correlations and causality, because it's no really point of discussing causality if you don't see any correlations, any links between the phenomena. But on the other hand, we can get random correlations. So correlations are not proving any causality, but you need to make a research process in this field needs to both start to look at correlations, or at least temporal agreements, and then go on to causalities. And because it's still relatively little interdisciplinary collaborations, especially historians have not been very much involved in these larger research teams. You have this separation still in the research traditions. But despite this, it's very clear that in the last 20 years, it has been shown that climate variability can no longer simply be conceived as a passive backdrop to human history. It at least needs to be seen as some type of agent for at least the agriculture, demographic and economic history, even in the last millennium, especially when it comes to food security issues and what follow up on changes in food security. And now I move on to the final part of my presentation, which I hope to make brief. And again, you are the first audience with outside of this research team of me and my five collaborators that will see the preliminary results today of an article also to be submitted in less than two months. The significance of climate variability on early modern European grain prices. So why studying grain prices? Simply because grain was the most important food source in early modern Europe. It represented between 70 and 80% of the calorie intake for the majority of the population. It was no other source of food that could compensate for a shortfall in grain. And the availability and the price of grain affected the average standard of living, including fertility and mortality, and it also decided the real income level during this time, because if the price of grain went up, you could afford to buy less of other things, especially among the urban laborers. And this even resulted in a decrease of demand on the decrease of demand of other products during times of high grain prices and la the, this lack of demand you couldn't afford to buy other things resulted in a kind of sometimes economic depression because people only could afford grain-based food and basically nothing else. <laughs> 
So it had big impacts on the whole economic and society system. And grain also, because of its importance, was the most important product in large-scale trade and the best monitored field of economic activity in early modern Europe and the first large bulk trade around Europe. The recent advances in paleoclimatology that I mentioned, together with more sophisticated statistical methods, make it possible to reassess the climate grain price relationship that had drawn interest among scholars already in Sam time in 1895, actually even before, because it was a British, British astronomer, Herschel, that in 1801 wrote an article where he linked the sunspot numbers to the prices of wheat in England. And the, with higher sunspot numbers, he saw lower grain prices, lower wheat prices in England, and with fewer sunspots, higher grain prices. And he linked this to, or indirectly to climate, because we know that it's a tendency to a warmer climate with more sunspots, with higher solar activity, and with less sunspots, typically slightly colder climate. So this even goes back to 1801, this interest in the research. But the thing is, that there have been very contested views of the impact of climate on grain prices in early modern Europe. Some scholars have seen a huge impact, some have seen none. It's the same in the link between solar variability and grain prices. Some scholars have seen huge impacts, some means that it's just random statistical correlations that don't mean any causality. The reason for this is that most have studied rather short and few grain price series and have access to re pretty poor climate data. Another thing is that almost all scholars have only looked at the high frequency variability, the interannual variability, and not long-term trends. One reason for this is that you simply have detrended the grain price series to get rid of inflation and only preserved the high frequency information. So you have not been able even to assess the long-term trends. It's actually only one study that ever have studied long-term trends in grain prices combined with climate. And the state of the art, to summarize it or paraphrase it, is that most scholars think that the interannual variability in early modern times on grain prices to a large extent was dependent on climate, but the long-term trends had no climate influences. It simply had uh, sociopolitical and socioeconomic uh, circumst uh, circumstances governing the grain prices. So I collected 56 different grain price series. The largest data set collected so far, it's 10 price series running between about 1500 to 1800 of, of, of barley, seven of oat, 14 of rye and 25 of wheat. Distributed across uh, Western and Central Europe. This is simply too many series to work with. You have a problem if you want to work with 56 series and correlate them to climate reconstructions and early instrumental data. It's too much to work with. You also presumably, if you average them somehow, will get a stronger climate signal. Um, I'm sorry, not a stronger climate signal, a stronger common grain price series. You also, with this number of series, have what is called the spatial degree of freedom problem, a statistical problem that I don't have the time to go into, but, but it's quite severe for this kind of calculation. So what I did was to combine them with help of a cluster analysis, the grain price series. And the cluster analysis basically find those series that show the biggest covariability in price and cluster them together so we can get m averages, means of the series that are most similar. And we can see here for wheat where we have 25 series that we get one nice cluster of Iberian and Spanish records that covaries 
one of Italian records, one of West Central European records, basically France, then an East Central group, basically Germany, and then the peripheral group at the Atlantic seaboard. They have fewer records to work with and less of a problem. Then I just show the se all the Syria show common variability. I have low pass filtered them here for visualization, but I'm working with actual annual data. And then I want to point out two periods that I have highlighted here, the 30 years war and the, Fran and the period after the French Revolution. They are excluded from the analysis, not from preliminary analysis, but the final analysis. And that's simply because early research, as well as my own research, has shown that during these two periods, there's no covariance between grain harvests, the size of the harvest, and the price. The price is decided by political factors, blockades, and other things. So it's no mean to include this period in the calculations. Then we have two annual mean temperature reconstructions from documentary data and this in uh, green, this summer temperature reconstruction from tree rings that I showed before. And we also have three tree ring based regional drought indices as well as three solar reconstruction or sunspot reconstruction series to work with. So what are we finding? I'm going, just going to take five more minutes and I will try to show the main results. This is a correlation analysis, a Pearson correlation of all time series against each other. And, or not all, actually, 10 long instrumental series, five of precipitation and five of temperature for the longest meteorological stations in Europe covering the 18th century that are shown here. And then we have all the grain price series against each other. And you see this dark red correlations here. It shows that you, all the grain price series correlate pretty well with each other, which is expected. But we also see the blue colors here against grain prices and temperature. Uh, and this, it's not very strong co negative correlations, but it is negative correlations in blue. And negative correlations here simply means that you have high prices when you have a cold climate and you have low prices when you have a warm climate. And here we see that the prices are high when it's colder, expected from the literature review I presented a little while ago. But the correlations are not super strong and, and many of them are not statistically significant. And this is not surprising because we only have a 100-year period or so with instrumental data overlapping with this grain price series. So we have to go to reconstructions, to reconstructed climate data. And here we see a little bit, um, uh, now this pointer is not working properly, I think. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, there, there you go. It's at least somewhat... Um, darker blue colors, stronger negative correlations. Now we have 300 years of data almost to work with, excluding the 30 years war. And we get much stronger correlations, both against annual mean temperature and reconstructed summer temperature. And the strongest correlations are found between the average of each grain type and the average summer temperature of Europe. And the single strongest correlation, and this is interesting in my opinion, comes from the average of all 56 grain price areas and the average summer temperature. On this large spatial scale, average all the series, you get the strongest correlation, minus 0 0.41. And we can also note that every single grain price cluster correlates negatively with temperature. They show consistently some stronger than others, but all clusters, even the Spanish and the Iberian cluster, is correlated negatively with temperature. High temperature gives low prices, low temperature gives high prices. I may also point out that you see on the slide already, if you're observant, that I have lagged the grain prices one year 
compared to climate to temperature and that's because the prices are follow up on the harvest with some time lag so the strongest signal is one year basically after the, t uh, the climate conditions that have prevailed and I can also point out this we find no correlation basically more than a few random correlations against hydroclimate against drought it's a very weak signal it's a very messy signal too against solar variability it pops up somewhere and somewhere not this is either random correlations or it's actually an inconsistent regional signal compared to temperature that shows a homogeneous coherent signal and I will briefly show the last plot now before I go to the conclusions I know that some of you may are used to this type of figures and some are not at all used to this type of figures it shows spectral analysis cross-spectral analysis between the grain price and the climate series and the grain price and the solar forcing series uh, done in different software environments and with slightly different implementations I don't have the time to go into that but we can see that you have a common period a common period uh, cycle about 16 years 16 17 years both in the grain prices and in the temperature but we can also see in this wavelet plot that this is not uh, stable over time. You mainly find it in the late 17th century and early 18th century. It's an unstable cycle and it's not this cycle that is driving this negative correlation. This is very evident, but more, a more general correlation. And then we find, and this is the same about 16 year period, in the solar t forcing time series and in the grain prices but what is more important is that we don't find 11 year sunspot cycle at all in the grain prices and that's the leading cycle in the solar forcing data an 11 year cycle it's not shown at all in the grain prices and it really shows that solar forcing is not a driver behind grain price variability temperature alone are so move on to the implications of this study this strong negative temperature and grain price relationship is quite surprising actually as grain prices only reflects to a certain extent the harvest yields variations because grain prices are also decided by the market organization economic conditions political and institutional settings the efficiency and cost of transportation the level and demand and so forth but still we find this strong correlation and the lack of accurate harvest yield data makes it challenges to quantify the relationship between grain prices and harvest yields next year I'm going to start a study trying to do that with the harvest yield data we actually have but that's another story uh, so the importance of precipitation and drought is often put forward also for European agriculture but this is not something we can see here it seems to be temperature alone and this very weak hydroclimate signal that is in general negative that is wet gives high prices may come as a surprise to most but it was actually already pointed out by Bruckner 1895 why you see often find surprise for this kind of results it's more to do with fears of consequences of future global warming and media uh, warnings about droughts and so forth for agriculture more than a historic reality and the significance of temperature is mainly due to scale temperature covaries over large scales and will have an impact of grain prices on a large scale so my last two slides what does this lead us well first I have been the first in this study to actually demonstrate a strong negative grain price temperature correlation relationship holding true both for the entire of Europe but also for oats barley rye as well as wheat earlier research have only looked at wheat furthermore 
this negative correlation increases with spatial scale, and it's strongest when you average all the grain prices to the average summer temperature. And we also find that the grain price temperature relationship was especially strong during the coldest periods of Little Ice Age, but also that in the 18th century have less of a climate influence on grain prices with a more advanced market and better transportation and also improvements in agriculture, grain prices became less climate sensitive. And again, we have no relationship between grain prices and climate during the Thirty Years' War or the French Revolution. And the implication of this study is also that we find clusters of the coldest years, the coldest summers in the early modern period, all the 10% coldest summers were clustered between 1574 and 1704. Before and after you'd have no other coldest summers and this, this very cold summers that leads to high prices. And this is disproving the earlier notions in historical scholarship that climate shocks, so to say, on agriculture came as random shocks, just random. It actually following very clearly a low frequency trend in climate that makes them clustered. And this stronger uh, temperature grain price relationship that we found compared to earlier scholarship, it has some implications because it implies that climate had a bigger impact on economic history, even in southern Europe, than commonly acknowledged. Because summer temperature on decayed timescales is found to explain as much as the 40% of the early modern grain price variability. 40% of the grain price variability on decayed timescales in Europe in the early modern period is found to be explained by summer temperature alone. And when we consider that grain prices had such a tremendous impact on the economic and societal development and well-being in early modern Europe, we must ask a selfie question. Is this not an argument to give climate change the role of agency in economic history? Thank you so much.